Hi, I'm Graham Blackburn, and in today's episode of Traditional Woodworking by Hand, we're going to be talking about back saws. In a previous episode, we've talked about frame saws which were necessary because we hadn't yet developed the, the ability to make a saw blade thin enough to be practical, but thick enough to be strong enough to actually make a decent saw cut. So for the longest time, in addition to frame saws, most single bladed saws had to have some kind of strengthening back. Here's an example of what in Britain is known as a back saw. Now Americans, in American usage, people tend to call all saws that have an extra strengthening back, they tend to call them tenon saws. But a tenon saw is a particular kind of back saw. It's much clearer if we refer to all these saws that have a strengthening piece on the back as a back saw, then we can distinguish between tenon saws and gent saws and a few of these other saws that I'm going to be showing you a little later. This one actually is a tenon saw and it's called a tenon saw because its main job is to cut the tenon part of a mortise and tenon joint. Now here you see three pieces of a, a frame and these parts are called the tenons. Uh, old carpenters sometimes call these the tenants, and they explain that that's because this part is the tenant of the mortise. That's the piece of wood that has the holes that the tenant goes into. But whether you call it tenon or tenant, this is the saw that's used to saw carefully the actual tenon. To do that, it needs to be fairly thin, but if it's going to be thin enough to work, it needs a strengthening back. This is an example of a, a fairly modern tenon saw. Years ago, most tenon saws were tapered. And here's one. This is probably from about the 1850s. And you can see that it's narrower in the front than it is at the back. And the reason for that is because if you hold the saw properly, and remember, I've said this several times before, the handles, properly known as the tote, are always designed just for three fingers, so the other finger points in the direction that you're going. If you use a tapered tenon saw, then it's much easier if you stand in line with the tenon that you're sawing to make sure that you're not wavering from the line. Now, it should be apparent that, as we talked about in previous issues when we were dealing with uh, regular hand saws, that there are two kinds of teeth that are commonly made on saws. There are teeth designed to work more efficiently when you're going with the grain, and there are teeth that are more efficiently designed when you're going across the grain. So what do you do with a tenon saw? Well, as you can see here, if I'm sawing here, I'm essentially sawing long grain. But when I come to saw this part, then I'm going across the grain. That's the reason why, although they some manufacturers do in fact make tenon saws with both rip teeth and crosscut teeth, but most tenon saws really only need to have crosscut teeth because by the time you're sawing here, you're typically sawing finished wood, you're making a very exact cut, the wood is probably seasoned. You don't need a big set. It doesn't make that much difference whether you're using a crosscut teeth or rip teeth when you're sawing the tenons. As I said, this, this is an example of a 19th century one that's a little tapered at one end. 
Uh, here is an example of a more modern tenant saw. This is an American one, and uh, they, it's a back saw, but they call it a tenant saw because it's used for that. This has a blade here that's the same width all the way along. Typically, you use the back saw with a bench hook. You put a piece of wood in and make a few strokes back. And it works great for cutting off the end of a piece of wood. One of the problems or one of the difficulties when you're cutting tenons is that if you want the work to be neat, you have to cut the tenon down to the exact depth. If you're a little sloppy and you saw like this, you end up with a gap that both weakens the joint and looks sloppy. So there's a way around that. And one of the typical ways of doing that is that you can take advantage of what often is one of the biggest disadvantages of a tenon saw, which is that the back can limit the amount that you can saw. Look at this piece of wood here. If I were to saw here and I wanted to saw all the way down, I'd get stopped by the back. So I can really only saw, make a saw cut as deep as the, as the back will allow me to. But taking advantage of this disadvantage, I can use it to my advantage by clamping a piece of scrap, a guide. I would do that by doing this here, and I would measure carefully the depth that I actually needed. And this one I'm going to saw, I'm going to fix so that it's perfectly parallel. Put this on, and of course I'd, I'd measure here to make this was the same. Tighten this up, and now I've made myself a depth gauge. If I wanted to be really careful, I'd clamp yet another piece of wood just like this on the other side, and I could use what is basically a disadvantage to good advantage by having a depth stop. No matter how much I sawed, this would limit the cut perfectly. So when I was cutting this here, if you see it this way around, you can see that I would only be able to saw down to the exact depth. So here are two, two examples of tenon saws, specifically designed to cut tenons. Now, you might think, because you're sawing with the grain and across the grain, what kind of teeth should you have? Well, because the cut is usually pretty fine, most tenon saws are cut with cross-cut teeth. You don't need the extra strength for the rip teeth. But, needless to say, people have thought of that. Here is another saw, another back saw, but this is unusual by virtue of the fact that the back, this is the back, is adjustable. If I loosen this, I can move the saw, I can move the back up or down. I can even adjust it so that I could make a sloping cut. And the other advantage of this is that it has rip teeth on one side and it has cross cut teeth on the other side. This is a relatively rare saw, but it has those two wonderful examples. It has both kinds of teeth and it has a movable back that you can adjust to work as a depth gauge. Its main disadvantage is that the handle is perhaps not quite so convenient if you use it on this side as if you use it on that side. So there are three back saws that can be used for tenons. The next major group of back saws, and this is why I like to call them back saws and not call them all tenon saws, are back saws that are much smaller. And here's an example of a contemporary smaller backed saw that's actually properly known as a dovetail saw. 
Now dovetails are a joint that you cut with the grain. Nevertheless, uh, the joint that you're cutting, the saw cut that you're making, is so narrow that most of these, if you look carefully, are all cut with rip teeth because most of the work that you do with a dovetail saw is cutting down with the grain and not across the grain. This is a dovetail saw, so it's a useful distinction. This is a tenon saw, this is a dovetail saw. Here is yet another example. In the 19th century, when woodworking also became a hobby of gentlemen and the idle rich, they developed a whole line of tools called gent tools for gentlemen. And this is an example of a gent tool. It doesn't have the fancy handle. It just has a straight pistol grip here. But these are also, for our purposes today, almost as useful as these. Uh, I prefer the nicer handle of a dovetail saw, but a gent saw also works perfectly well. So just so you know, this is a gent saw. One of the more useful things that you can do with all of these saws is to protect the teeth rather than just throw them in your toolbox or throw them on the floor. I like to make little cases. Here's an example of a case that I make from my dovetail saw. It's just any piece of scrap wood. In this case, it's a piece of pine. And I simply saw out the slot deep enough to hold the whole saw and relieve the end so that the handle comes in. It's a really simple but useful way to preserve the teeth on your backed saws. Another pair of backed saws consists of a veneer saw, and I don't actually have a dedicated veneer saw without a handle. Usually the handle is up here, but it's a very short saw with a curved edge designed for sawing veneer. This is not a piece of veneer, but you can see how if this was a thin piece of wood, this would work really well. And the second kind is what's known as a dowel saw. And to all intents and purposes, a dowel saw looks just like a dovetail saw, but since it's intended to saw off the ends of dowels that you've put into some work, the handle is offset. Instead of a dedicated dowel saw, this is one occasion where I do actually use a Japanese saw because it has a really bendy blade. And you can see, because of that, how easy it is to saw off the end of a dowel perfectly flush with the wood that it's in. There's one other backed saw that deserves mentioning, and that's usually the giant of the whole family, and that's known as the mitre box back saw. And since mitre boxes can be pretty large, the saw has to be pretty large. The mitre box itself is adjustable, so you can cut mitres of any kind of angle, uh, but you secure the angle at the, which you want to cut, and then you saw off. And this is probably the granddaddy of all back saws. And there we have the result of the backed mitre box saw. So, I hope that was instructive. And uh, I hope you learned a little bit about backed saws, so that you call them backed saws, rather than call them all tenon saws, because they don't all work on tenons. If you want to know more, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And take a look at the chapter that I've written in this book, all about back saws. And you'll find pictures of prehistoric back saws, and you'll find examples of how you can use them in bench hooks, 
and how you can make depth guides and even a few other varieties that we didn't discuss this time. So thank you for listening. Come back soon and learn something more about traditional woodworking at hand.